Uh, this is the Monday, July 31st meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. Uh, and as all of you know, this meeting is being held remotely and it is also being video recorded. We always start these meetings with a public comment period and um, I'm happy to entertain public comment now. So if, if there are folks in, in the audience in attendance who would like to speak, if you could just identify yourself in your uh, address, please. And Jackie Balance first. Becky? Um, yes, Jackie Balance, uh, 35 Warner Street in Florence. I have a question for Sarah uh, when she gives her, her report. Uh, I'd like to know whether or not the city has made any effort in the past couple weeks to find out where the Barrett Planning Group stands in relation to submitting their final report. They're months past their expected completion date. And um, yeah, they we deserve to know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Claudia, let's go. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I have a question really about a couple of questions. One is about when the meeting might go live because I find it more stressful to try to find the meeting online and connect. Uh, I was at a meeting in um, Carolyn's office for the transport pedal and bike committee. And it was really nice to be there because people could like exchange ideas and look each other in the face and understand who you're speaking with. So I'm hoping this meeting will go uh, live. And then I have a few sort of philosophical comments to make. And I, I don't know, I, I think I might want to get on the agenda at some point, but I don't know how to do that. As everyone knows, I've been very concerned about what's happening in my Montview neighborhood, specifically around the demolition of 107 William Street. And it's taken me on this long path about thinking about Northampton, the history of Northampton. What is good? What do we want to save? What is worth parting with? And one of the things that occurs to me that's very difficult is that the historic preservation or historic uh, maybe people who do historic preservation, and it seems that they look at individual buildings, that they look at famous architects or places where famous people lived, rather than looking at some hole. So I've been doing this research on Montview, one of the oldest neighborhoods in the city, the view from Mount Holyoke, the most famous view maybe ever that attracted thousands of people. They're looking down on my neighborhood, Montview, which is targeted, you know, for infill. So this concerns me because I have, I don't know how to, to approach this, how to get the city, how to get the historic commission, whomever, to try to broaden this view of, of what's, what's of value in the city, aside from that the whole maybe is worth more than the parts. So, and it applies to Montview and now it applies to, I'm going to comment about the, you know, downtown redesign, because once again, I feel like people are looking at downtown without taking the whole city into consideration. And it's a humongous project. I don't know if historic commission commented on it was this, uh, this reimagine or whatever it's called, Main Street, did it come before you? And then could you send me sort of the uh, the links to the meetings where it was discussed? So did it come before you? And what was the conversation? Because I live in the neighborhood of Pleasant Street. You know, I'm only a half a mile from downtown, but I'm concerned that whatever's going to happen on Main Street is going to have a negative impact on my neighborhood. So I have a huge number of questions for you. I don't expect you to answer them all. What I really would like to know is if at some point in the future on the agenda could be this discussion about looking at a whole rather than pieces. And what do people like many of you are professionals, you do this for a living. I'm interested in that conversation and I'm hoping to have it soon. So thanks for taking my comments, thanks. That's it. Thanks, Claudia. Much appreciated. Um, I have James Winston. 
Hi, um, good afternoon, James Winston. Uh, I'm at uh, 234 Preston Street, Northampton. Grew up in Northampton, Northampton native. My uh, my late father, Norman Winston, was part of historical uh, Northampton on the commission for for years and years and always took pride, especially in his retirement and serving um, in part of your wonderful organization. Um, I just, well, first of all, just as a procedural question, um, I, I'm, I received an email from uh, somebody that wanted to issue a public comment and, and Sarah, I believe she emailed it to you, uh, Jacqueline McCreener from Ward 3 and she isn't able to, to make the meeting. So I don't know if there were plans to read or comment. I could read it. I actually printed out the email and kind of agree with her. Um, I agree with her her points. And and if you'll indulge me, I could read it now into the record. Um, I'm, so, look, I'm actually looking to Sarah for that. Is it? Um okay for uh, a person to be represented by someone else in a situation like this? I don't know. I've never had this happen before. Right, right. I mean, I can give my own comments. No, I just no, no, want to, to, I'll, I'll say my own comments. It's it, it just, I, I do want to, she wrote a beautiful email about um, downtown Main Street, of course, a historic old city. And the concern is about the proposed redesign on Main Street and and, and what your commission may have, have not even been given uh, in terms of your input on how this will change the historic nature of this downtown Northampton. And that's that's part of the beauty of this great Main Street um, that we have is the wide Main Street. And I think when the city tried this as a experiment in August of 2020, narrowing Main Street so it was one lane each way in the heart of downtown, they uh, changed um, the angled parking to parallel parking. Um, they eliminated most parking spaces. And this was during the heart of the pandemic and it just, it, it really didn't work. And the city took the experiment down. It was supposed to go from August to November. And it really changed the complexion of downtown Northampton. I mean, the majority of people would say for the worse. Um, and, and now the city is planning to do this again but make it permanent. And what we were hoping that maybe the historical commission would back is what we're asking the city to do is a trial run. Before we make something permanent, such as narrowing Main Street and having to figure out how the snow is going to be cleared from Main Street and how the cars are gonna get by, uh, before we make anything permanent, can we do this as a trial run? Uh, the city's plan is to take away over a third of the, the um, parking spaces on uh, that now exist on Main Street. All parking from Michelson Gallery to CVS will now be gone because in the middle of Main Street where trucks unload, that would now be an unloading area. And is there support for a trial run to see if this is sustainable, if this makes sense before embarking on a three plus ye years of tearing up Main Street? And I would say destroying much of the beauty of, of this great downtown. I love looking at the old pictures of Main Street and you can see buildings in the street, how it looked so many years ago. And it did not look that way in August of 2020 with the narrowing of Main Street. And I'm afraid the city is making a huge mistake without doing the traffic studies, without doing a trial run before committing to this. And I would love if, the, if this commission could perhaps uh, have some input on that. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, Steve Strymer, you have your hand up. Did you want to make a public comment? Uh, I want to, is it possible to ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, I just uh, went by 67 Park Street and I didn't, I haven't stayed up with what's happened there. Is it going to be demolished or is uh, has something been worked out? They had a, I saw on the, uh, you know, the yellow circle that they had a meeting on the planning board, I think, or the zoning board on the 27th. And I'm just curious where things stand with that. Sir, can you remind us on that? Uh, yeah, I'll, let me add a addenda to your chair's report when we get to that, about that item. Okay, sure. That'd be great. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, Steve, you can let your hand down. It's distracting. Huh? 
I don't, I don't, I haven't oh, no. done this. <laughs> it's good to okay. be distracted. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a brief chair's report. Um, I wanted to just update uh, everybody on a couple things. Um, one is uh, we have been promised the draft of the preservation plan by Labor Day. Hopefully um, we will see some progress at that point, um, but that's where that is. Uh, second of all, I don't know if Greg, you and Steve were around when we reviewed the old blessed, old, I should say it's an old church, old blessed sacrament church, which is now under different ownerships at the very north end of the local historic district on Elm Street. Um, but anyway, um, Sarah and I had a, a just back and forth about this uh, because I noticed that the windows, um, which are supposed to be, you know, preserved, um, the stained glass windows on the side have been removed and they're looks like they're covered with plexiglass. Um, so we did get a note from the architect who's uh, overseeing this project and he did reassure us in his note that the windows are going uh, undergoing restoration. They were removed and created and they were actually on the inside of the building um, and they are restoring them. So and he didn't give us a date as to when this was all gonna be completed, but um, I guess it allayed our fear somewhat that they had been disposed of completely. Um, and speaking of uh, former Catholic churches, um, St. Mary's, which is at the other end of the local historic district in downtown, um, is uh, it's the, the church is moving towards a sale of that. And so we'll be watching carefully um, how that plays out uh, in the future. So it's just something to keep your eye on. Mm. And also it, I, it's great to report that the Smith Charities building received a Massachusetts Preservation Projects Fund grant, which is a match to what the CP, CPC awarded or the city awarded to them in the last round of funding. So they're gonna be moving ahead with another phase of their restoration work on the exterior, which is great, it's an important building. And great that they were successful in getting that money. It's very difficult to get. Thank you okay. for that, uh, especially I was not around for Blood Sacrament Church, which is where I went when I was a little kid. But as somebody oh. was asking about that over the weekend. So thank you for that uh, update on Blood Sacrament. Oh, you're welcome. And Martha, add, I'll add about 67 Park Street. Um, so th this was uh, the old schoolhouse in Florence that the commission issued um, a preferably preserved determination and a one-year demolition delay. Uh, the, the owner looked hard into options for saving the, the structure after that determination. He heard that it was uh, an important historic resource. So only the, the newer, they're still old, but newest sections of the school will be demolished. And um, the the main older section of it will be repurposed into housing. Great, thank you. Yeah, and just I remember the discussion about that. It's a fairly large lot, correct? So. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that that will remain in front, and some additional units will be developed in the the rear as well. Okay. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, we have a, a set of minutes from January thirtieth. I don't know, if, uh, Greg and Steve, you had a chance to look at that. Yes, I did. Those he was not at, oh, Steve was at the meeting, sorry. I thought you were still prone at that point. <laughs> I'm glad that's, that you weren't. Um, did anyone have a chance to take a look at these and do uh, any questions or corrections? And if not, um, I'd entertain a motion to approve them. I make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay. Sarah, if we need to do a roll call vote. And quick roll call, Greg? Yes. Steve? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Thank you. Great. Okay, the next item is uh, the review of the proposed 27 Crafts Avenue housing pro um, um, ever that's going on. And I believe um, Laura Baker is here. And are, is there another representative on that project? Yeah, I'm the background representative. So we have Jill DeCourcy, who's from the architects firm of Jones Witset, who's gonna do most of our presenting. And right. then Bill Wommeldorf, who's actually the project manager for this specific project. Okay, perfect. Um, Steve and Greg, you know where this project is, I'm assuming. Um, yes. And uh, so 
I don't um, think we need probably any more of an introduction from my point, my my mouth, but um, I hand it over to Jill. It's Jill, correct? Yeah. 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 I to, can't, uh, can't change my uh, name here, so yeah. <laughs> okay, oh, that's Jill. fine. All right, so I can go ahead and share my screen. Oh, can I um can I share my screen? Yes, now you should be able to. All right. Are you seeing the PowerPoint presentation? Yep. Good. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. So, Bill. Yeah, and I will um, actually kick it off and and give it back to Jill here. Um, so feel free to start the slide deck. Uh, it should be pretty quick since a lot of folks are familiar with the site. So I'm, I'm largely going to familiarize folks with the request for proposals that was um, done, I think, about fall of last year. Um, and Jill, I, I don't know, are you going to share the... Uh, I did. Is it not showing? I'm seeing it in the PowerPoint view, uh, if you're able to put it onto the... Um, okay. Let me try that one more time. I yeah. apologize. Uh, We're so delighted that that brutalist staircase is going away. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yes, yeah, so we were reminded from Carolyn that uh, the plan was to remove the staircase no matter what. So that was... Uh, um, I didn't know that. We were going to hold yeah. on to it for a, a reminder. <laughs> a relic okay, of... Are you getting oh, the whole screen now? Yes, we're seeing the whole screen now. Okay, so great. Sorry I, I do want to say that. hi, I'm, I'm Bill Womeldorf from uh, Valley Community Development. I'm the project manager for this project, working uh, closely with Laura, who's also what? on the call. Uh, the location is is perfect oh, for- that happens to me. Ooh, I'm hearing uh, some- Can you please mute yourself if you're not presenting? Thank you. So the location that we, we find it excellent for uh, this proposed housing project, largely because uh, it's right downtown. So people can kind of walk to and from different workplaces, but also uh, to, you know, banks or schools and, and having the uh, transit facility at the local bus station and the, the bike trail, which is shown in that kind of maroon color line. Um, if you go to the next slide here, I can show you the existing survey of that lot. Uh, so it's a combination of two different city-owned parcels uh, that were kind of carved out uh, as a result of, of prior studies uh, by the previous mayor's office for panhandling and trying to come up with solutions to uh, the unhoused folks who you know are, are, are living regionally in, in downtown. Uh, I think the panhandling study uh, showed that most folks were unhoused, um, which kind of led to the city council approving uh, the split off of this parcel uh, for a developer who is going to build affordable housing. Uh, Valley's uh, proposal was accepted, and this was towards the end of, of late of last year. Uh, the next slide here will show you some of the RFP requirements. Uh, so a part of it is we're working with closely with Joan Woodset to come up with a design that is highly energy efficient uh, and is historically welcomed into this district. Uh, so the, the, largely the, the city kind of helped facilitate the kickoff of that design process. Uh, on our side, we need to create a minimum of 20 units uh, with the majority of those units being for folks who are already unhoused. Uh, and then the last part is, you know, if we don't develop on the parcel within five years, it, it does revert back to the city. So who's going to be here? We're, we're planning uh, 30 studio sized apartments. Uh, five of those are going to be fully accessible while the rest will be visitable uh, with an elevator in, in the building. Uh, 20 of the 30 apartments will be for folks who are currently unhoused uh, and, and meet a, a, what we call very low income. Uh, threshold while well, the other 10 are going to be for what we call kind of more workforce housing uh, which will be folks who are largely making minimum wage uh, who might benefit from 
or you know businesses might benefit from having uh, a stable source of of residents downtown uh, that can walk uh, to and from work. The ground floor of the site we are planning to have on site uh, property management services in addition to resident service coordinating, uh, which I can provide more details on for folks uh, in the room. But the benefits that we see uh, with this project are, are fourfold uh, that are worth noting. Uh, one obvious one is it, it takes a, a city owned parcel that isn't generating tax revenue and, and puts it onto the tax roll. Uh, secondly, create stable, affordable housing downtown, which uh, we've seen lead to, you know, the ability to have folks uh, who are making lower income, you know, be able to commute to and from work more effectively. But we also find that, you know, having people uh, live downtown uh, creates uh, more economic uh, help for the local businesses through mercantile or res or restaurant purchases. And then, uh, you know, by the nature of this RFP, uh, we'll be providing uh, a, a very high level of energy efficiency with uh, renewables, uh, in addition to not having fossil fuels on site. So it's a, it's a very high quality project uh, that we're, we're really excited about. And uh, I'm going to pass it over to Jill to talk about how we're going to uh, welcome it into the historic district downtown. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, hi, everyone. I am Jill DeCourcy. I'm an architect with Jones Whitset Architects. Um, very happy to have this chance to present the project to you. Um, what you're seeing on this slide um, is just our site location, the yellow dot. We do fall within the downtown historic district. We anticipate doing a 106 review a little bit later on in the project development. Um, but you know, what we were hoping for today is to have a chance to just introduce you to the project and have sort of an informal conversation about it while we're still fairly early in the design process. So circling to the site, um, what you're seeing here is the overall view, and then on the right, we have the um, current site proposal. The yellow lines are showing the property lines for the site. It's a pretty, um, it's pretty unusual. It's a pretty, uh, it's a challenging site. It's not very big, and there is a more than a 20-foot grade change across the, across the site. So from the south to the north, we're gaining something like 22 feet. Um, so that uh, with the, you can see we are building, taking advantage of the lack of setback requirement to try to maximize the um, footprint on this little site and are, are dealing with that significant grade element. Some immediate context um, images. I know everybody on this call is familiar with this area. It's right downtown. Um, but I do think it's still useful to have the visual reminder of where the building, the building context we're fitting into. And, you know, I think most significantly is that we are right across the parking lot from City Hall. Um, and we are very aware of that and have tried to be very conscientious during the design development to make sure we're going to be a good neighbor to that landmark building. Um, and we'll be, you know, interested in your input on that as we go forward. So um, in addition to looking at the immediate context buildings, we've also been studying um, the some of the um, historic multifamily housing in Northampton. The proposal is a completely residential building. There is not a commercial component to it. Um, although there are no residential units on the ground floor, um, it is all residential. So it's uh, been helpful to kind of study what, what the precedent is in Northampton. I think the, the property on the upper left, which is 61 South Street, is maybe the most comparative to what we're looking at. You know, in this case, that's a six-story building with a four-story portion beyond, and it spans a pretty significant grade change as well. Um, and I, it also um, transitions from the more kind of urban 
downtown area to a residential area beyond. So it's a, a useful comparison point. We've also uh, looked at um, a number of the newer buildings downtown to see, you know, what what's working, what makes these successful. Um, some takeaways, you know, of course, having masonry on the street front is um, is helpful. Um, looking at, you know, how these newer buildings are creating depth in the facade and detail. Um, looking at some of these roof elements and how those fit in with the historic context. And then, um, so th this building project, like like any building, has a lot of different um, influences on it, a lot of factors shaping the design. Um, as Bill mentioned, this is a passive house building, so we have some pretty strict requirements for our building envelope. It also um, is providing affordable housing, so we want to make sure we're maximizing the footprint available to um, residential spaces. Um, we also do fall within the central business district side street zone, so we are um, covered by the new form-based zoning code. And that is what this slide is intended to help illustrate is how that form-based code, which has some pretty um, comprehensive prescriptive requirements for the massing and, and building elevations um, has impacted our design. So just to very quickly run through it, we are looking at, you know, maximizing the, the area available to housing, but then there's a required setback uh, of the building on the primary facade um, after uh, 50 feet. So the top two floors would be impacted. That's what you're seeing in that upper right diagram. We've been more generous with that setback in order to create a resident terrace and a resident amenity space. Um, but that move driven by the code it has um, helped define how we're breaking up the massing of the building. And you'll see that in the renderings to come. But also um, just matching the uh, horizontal divisions and then creating the vertical bays that are, you know, set out through that zoning code. So this is where that has taken us. Um, this is the proposed design viewed from uh, looking up Crafts Avenue. You can see the Roundhouse Plaza on the left and provisions on the right and Town Hall beyond the building. Um, you can see here how that um, massing move with the setback at the fifth floor has shaped the design. The approach we've taken is, is, is in effect breaking the mass into two units. So you have the front of the building, uh, which is the south facing portion that is essentially treated like a four story building proportion similar to other four story buildings in downtown Northampton. And then you have the taller mass to the north, uh, which with the 20 foot grade change um, reads essentially like a five story building in that um, built into that hill. And so uh, shifting the proportion somewhat to reflect that taller uh, building design. And then it is one building, it's all using the same palette and the same, you know, overall concepts and, and bays, but using that um, step down to help break up the mass. So what you're seeing here is the primary entrance, the, the resident day room is on that first floor is south facing, so you have more glazing in those areas. Um, but you can see the um, kind of the very symmetrical uh, layout with the windows, an emphasis on creating uh, a regular vertical um, rhythm in the building, and um, uh, kind of just making it relatable in proportions to the historic context while, while maintaining a, a modern design. Um, just to call out a few of the, the design features that we are exploring, um, that four-story portion, the south portion, um, would have a uh, some sort of parapet element. We've also been looking at three-dimensional brick patterning. We feel like that's a really um, kind of an exciting 
way to get uh, sort of detail and depth in the facade while still um, keeping a, a clean modern aesthetic. Uh, at the window bays and at that upper level, we're looking at an alternative material, a rain screen material, something lighter than the brick. Um, changing material at the top course is um, in keeping with uh, a lot of the taller buildings in Northampton where you have that base middle top element. Um, but in the overall, you know, the goal has been to not make the building overly tall to keep it um, light at the top so you're not drawn too much to the, the upper levels, upper stories, so it doesn't feel imposing. In terms of materials, we're looking at masonry, um, and then a rain screen material. It's not completely decided. It might be fiber cement. It might be a metal panel. We've been um, planning on something with a vertical rib or a vertical seam to uh, respond to the, the vertical kind of uh, orientation of the facade. Um, in terms of a color palette, we're looking at sort of a warm, neutral, color palette. Um, the hope is to create interest in the facade through depth and through detailing, um, more so than dramatic color shifts. And um, yeah, so this uh, drawing um, some inspiration from Town Hall, of course, we're not trying to match it completely, but we don't want to be detracting from, from that building. So here is another view of the proposed um, building. This is from the north, looking down Crafts Avenue. Here you can really see how that massing move with the setback is working to step the building down as you're going from downtown towards the, slight, light, the less dense area of Northampton. Um, you can also see how the building um, defines that street face working down Crafts Avenue. This view is also from the north. It's from the parking lot um, behind City Hall. Excuse me. And um, here you can really start to understand how dramatic that um, grade change is on the building. You know, this this part reads essentially as a four-story building because, because there is um, just a lot of elevation change. And you can see off on the right side of the building is a second exit uh, for the residents of the building. So that's off of the second stairwell. So the second egress is at that location. And then here we are on Main Street, peeking down Crafts Avenue behind um, City Hall. And so you can get a sense for the scale of the building and what you would be seeing um, from from Main Street. And that is that is it for our, you know, our quick overview. Um, I'm happy to uh, drive back to go back to other slides or take questions. Okay. Thank you, Jill. Sure. Thank you, William. Um, just so we're clear, you're looking for feedback from us on the design concept, correct? at this point? That's correct, because we are planning our zoning permit hearing uh, later in the month in August. Uh, and so at that point, you, sure would be a design, you would be at design development level? Is that about the level you would be with the drawings? We are at design development now. We're kind of okay. wrapping up that phase. Mm -hmm. And we are yet yeah, planning to go to the planning board in August. So we wanted to have a chance to share it with you guys before we go and start that process. Okay. And uh, another question, sir, we don't need to vote on this, do we? Uh, not at this point. They will be returning for a section 106 review. Um, so that would be the, the formal um, advisory input to Mass Historic, but this is just um, providing some feedback at this point. And uh, just so I'm clear, 106 review is required because there's federal funding going into this project? Yes, okay. we anticipate there will be federal funds. Okay, great. 
that's thank you. Those are my questions. Um, Greg and Steve, do you have any questions or comments? And I know Barbara also, who is in Sweden, sent some comments in um, that Sarah has, and we may want to share those. Can we do that, Sarah? Sarah, th share those, even though she's not here. Yeah, give me that. Okay, that's fine. Why don't you take them? Yeah, why don't you look for it? And um, Steve and Greg, um, if you have any questions or comments, that would be great. No questions, no comments. Okay. I do think, I'll tell you, I do think it is a uh, great idea, very much needed. Okay. And Steve? Um, I thought the presentation was very clear in the kinds of things that we would be thinking about, like massing and sight lines and materials and that sort of thing. Um, all were covered uh, in the presentation. So, um, yeah, I right now i feel comfortable um, with this in terms of compatibility i think you know one of the um just from a, a personal perspective one of the things i think um we do a little bit too much of in massachusetts is trying to match um and so walking that line between distinct and compatible to use the language of the secretary of interior standards is always an interesting exercise and um from these renderings at least uh it looks like you you've struck that balance um, quite well. It, it reads as uh, a distinctly new building, but one that's also um, compatible with some of the buildings around it. I guess the other thing that comes to mind for me is thinking a little bit about the former industrial context here. We had the big gas tanks and the railroad. And um, so if we think about the history of the district, um, you know, this was not right on, it's not the kind of building you would find right on Main Street, but um, you would have uh, much more utilitarian um, kinds of structures uh, going down to the railroad tracks and the the wet and where the river used to flow. So um, yeah, so I think in in those regards um, seems to be on track for something that's compatible and distinct. Okay, great. Uh, Barbara's you. questions yeah. were about the the massing of the structure. Um, she she felt that it was a bit large. Um, and she had questions about the design at the top, um, how it stepped back. She was wondering whether it's um, intended to hide mechanicals or whether that was a design consideration. Yeah, so the the setback is in going to be a resident terrace. So that that lower portion that we're seeing in this rendering is is for, for residents use. There will be mechanicals on the upper roof, which would be screened um, they would be partially visible, though, from from um, looking down from the top of Crafts Avenue. But, you know, the intention is definitely to screen it um, as best as we can. There also will be some solar panels on the upper roof as well in order to help meet the passive house requirements. OK, um, I, I did have a couple of questions, too. So there's no parking that's going to be going into this at all. Is that correct? That's um, correct. Okay, and that's obviously um, adheres to the zoning regulations. Um, in terms of this, I noticed the resident terrace on your drawings, and I wondered, is there going to be any treatment of the edge of that? Um, you know, a, a, a balustrade or some kind of uh, barrier? To... Yeah, yes. <laughs> we will be <laughs> um, definitely having um, ample guard, guard um, rails. At, at the moment, we're having a tall parapet, so we're actually concealing that. And the thought would be also to have something, um, you know, the sort of rail that keeps people from getting to, to all the way to the edge of the building, right? So it kind of pull, mm -hmm. pulls you back somewhat from the from the parapet edge. Does that make sense? So, so inside the parapet, if I'm standing on the terrace, how high would the parapet be? Um, right now it is, I think it's at 42 or 48 inches. So okay. it's, yeah. Yeah, it's within the phone. Okay, that's that's good. I, my, you know, my only thought was that if, if there was something more dramatic on this, it was, you know, more prominent, um, it would definitely affect the look of the building. So we'd probably want to see that. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Um, the other uh, question I had, and it's not really, I guess it is a design question, is just the alteration of it's Crafts Avenue, right? Um, 
this is going to create a very uh, um, dark area in the winter um, that's not going to get a lot of sun and there's a steep slope here um, and I'm just wondering about you know if you thought at all about um, you know I think in the late afternoon this is gonna be very dark and we have a lot of ice problems <laughs> these days um, and it was just a concern that I, I don't know if there's anything that can be done about that in the engineering of it, uh, just so you don't have a lot of water collecting there. It just feels like it, you know, it, it could be a little unsafe and then dark, you know, it's just dark because it's a tall building and um, there's going to be a long shadow cast across it, I would think, in the afternoon. So if you'd looked at any of that, you know, modeled any of that, that might be informative. Um, yeah, we... Um have not done like a, we have not done a formal sun study, although we've been intending to. So I think that hearing that is a good um, reminder that we will be doing that and we can kind of bring that information um, in future presentations. Uh, we are, you know, being conscientious of that in the replanting of the uh, kind of the hill beyond the building. So definitely making sure that whatever is getting planted there, hopefully that has a similar, you know, beautiful aesthetic to the flowers that are there currently is is going to be able to thrive in that in that condition. Yeah, Jill, I don't know if you wanted to speak on any of the stormwater. I, I, my understanding is that there's like a broken pipe right now that uh, expels water out. Um, and that what we're going to be doing is fixing, uh, a lot of, not just our existing lot, but some of the city, uh, lot parking lot on the upper front, uh, is going to be, you know, upgraded. Um, yeah, I know we don't have the site designer on the, on the call, but, um, we can, you know, get back to you on some details on that. Okay. There are yeah. some site improvements that happen along with this. I would just point out that, um, on Crafts Avenue, we are creating a bump out now on the southeast corner so and a dedicated crosswalk. So it should um, improve pedestrian safety uh, in that location where a lot of people are crossing the street. We are not losing any parking along Crafts Avenue, although some of it does get a little bit shorter for compact cars. And we are um, moving the EV charging station uh, to the uh, north side of the property from where it is currently kind of down a little bit below but keeping the same the same kind of parking conditions but improving the um the pedestrian safety there at the at the corner so it looks to me just from looking at this plan though that the sidewalk that's on the northern part of the east facade of this building is pretty narrow right is that even going to be so um, there is mind. not currently a sidewalk on that side of Crafts right. Avenue, and there will yeah. not be a sidewalk on there okay. with this project. We do have a buffer to keep the cars from being directly against the uh, against the, the building. But yeah, no, we are just working with the existing sidewalk on the east side of Crafts um, and um, maintaining as much as much buffer as possible there. Okay. Um, and then one other, well, and, and so the other, a couple other questions. So the build, the building and main entrance is down here at the Southeast corner, correct? Correct. And, but there is additional entrance um, on the West side uh, near the city hall annex. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's at about, it's at a two and a half stories up. Okay. And those are the two, those are yeah. going to be the two main. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And it'll actually be one single point of entry uh most likely that second exit to the upper lot will be an egress only door okay. um but we like to only have uh, a single entrance that's controlled with the uh auto locking and you know controlled access with the cameras okay um and then my final question if you could go back to the uh, view that shows um the north side of the building that would be great ah yeah uh, back well, yeah. So this one works. Maybe the other one before that. Okay, okay. yeah. This is. Yep. Um, I I think I discerned from the plans that this big blank um, uh, extent along the north side is is that's a stairwell, correct? Um, this uh, the blank area here is actually it's a bathrooms. It's a, it's okay. A restroom for, area for yeah. units on either side. Yeah. 
Okay, and you can't have windows in them? Yes, not. We um yeah, we have we have kind of played around with trying to get windows in there. It's it's pretty awkward from a from a layout standpoint. Um we also it, it runs into the case of like it's hard you can't quite make it symmetrical. So if it can't be symmetrical, we wanted to have balance and it felt like this was somewhat more more balanced. Um but uh yeah, no, something we definitely thought about and uh you know what exactly is happening in this case in this location is something else we've you know discussed different options for whether it's um the you know right now we're showing it as the green screen material but because we don't want to have just a completely blank facade we've also talked about you know not that we would rely on this in any way but likely that there would be some trees and plantings and things happening in this on this facade as well and Jill, can I just add to that too, with just mm -hmm. for the passive house requirement, uh, the north elevations are, you know, ones that usually just uh, have a, a negative effect to the um, energy performance of the building. So, uh, you know, voiding, putting more windows on the north side, um, you know, just is, is, a, is a key aspect of the passive house requirements. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, I think that, and this is this is like the the, the one design element that um, gave me some pause because it does feel, uh, you know, you've got this view from Main Street of it, unfortunately, and and you're up at a higher level when you're on Main Street, so it's going to be quite visible. And you know, I'm wondering if you can do something more with texture. This would also be a great artist collaboration. Um, if you thought about that at all, it could be really great. Um, so I would just encourage you to give that a little bit more thought because it is pretty blank and I think it's going to uh, stick out. Yeah. And, but I understand your rationale, believe me. Yeah. And also the, uh, yeah, I think the rationale is perfectly understandable. So Martha, this is Laura. It's funny because we had the, some of the same comments that you're making. And then we went through all these exercises where we looked at windows there and then we didn't like them. And it's, it's funny how things kind of grow on you over time. This is one of those things, but yes, we've definitely talked about treatment for that blank or a, a kind of mural or art display space um, could be nice there as well. But initially yeah. it also caught, I think Bill's eye especially and mine a little bit as, something was off, um, but we've, we've come to like it. <laughs> we're thinking all these different alternatives. And uh, Chair Lyon, we could definitely share you uh, some of the alternative uh, elevation studies as you know, we do have them. So I'm um, happy to okay. share those over to you. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see. I mean, I think, um, uh, yeah, I just give you, encourage you to give it a little more thought, mm -hmm. but I, I agree with my fellow commissioners that, um, this is going to be a great improvement to that area. Um, it's always felt unfinished to me and a missed opportunity. So, and I know the need is tremendous. So th that's great. Um, we do have one. Um, Claudia, do you have a qu question or comment you'd like to make? Because we can open this up to public comment at this point, unless Steve or Greg have other questions or comments. I, I did have one other question real quick. Um, does the building adjoin the municipal building next to it, or is there um, a patio or space between? And if there is, is there a public path, a circulation route from the upper level parking lot down? To the end, or is that going to be closed off? So there is not going to be a path from there down. That's actually where we have our um, twenty foot tall retaining wall happening. So uh, um, the the idea is that everybody would be using the new um, stairs and ramping off of Pulaski Park um, in place of of the you know the stair that is there currently. Um, we do have separation from the, the municipal building, which is where we're going to end up having some of our um, uh, bike, you know, bike storage entrance to the building and, and probably electric meters and things like that. So there, there is space there between, between the two buildings, um, but it's, it's more of a, a utility um, zone. Thank you. Yeah. Greg, did you have anything else? I did not. 
Okay, thank you. Claudia, Hi, you have a Yeah, you know, first of all, as someone who comes to town from the other, not from Main Street, but from down Pleasant Street, it's really easy. I ride my bike to that stairway and I go up. And that has been good for me personally. And um, so I will miss having the stairway there. Um, you know, will there be a public hearing about this building? Has there been a public hearing about it? Is this it? Is this the public hearing? The unfolding, the comments? Is is this it, the historic commission? Uh, I can speak on behalf of that. So we will be going in front of the planning board uh, in later August uh, for a zoning uh, hearing. Uh, this right here is a, a a public comment period for the historical commission to uh, review the plans and in preparation for that planning board hearing. So, right. This is oh. Laura. Claudia, we also did a, a meeting for the immediate abutters as well as an information meeting with the downtown business association. But those were just last week. So you haven't really missed anything. It's been just now kind of coming into the public eye. And I know there was an article in the Gazette that came out about it probably two or three weeks ago as well. But the well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'm just not sure. I, I won't go on too much, but I just want to say that downtown is being covered with buildings at a time, you know, there's going to be an upper patio, but, you know, sitting out in the sunshine in this weather doesn't seem like it's appealing and there's no trees available up there. And in the winter, it's not available. Um, you know, I live in the neighborhood of the lumber yard, which is a huge, you know, 55 apartments on Pleasant Street. It's the air quality from is terrible, as I understand it, from a number of tenants who live there because they're in a major, you know, they're in this intersection. They're surrounded by parking lots and thoroughfares. And this building is going to be there, too. There's the McDonald House. There's the restaurants, the parking lots. It's all like, you know, surrounded by concrete and pavement and so forth and it, i mean honestly i look at it and i think like is this a good place to live you know the the people at the lumber yard they hanging out on pleasant street there is no built-in green space there so for my own you know my passion about this i mean i'm just shocked actually to lose that which wasn't a great green space but still this this open space to have it taken up by this building, you know, and yes, it, you know, I mean, I think one of the issues is, and then I'll stop that we have really high end housing and low end housing, and where we really need housing are for people who work have jobs in town who work in town and families. And so then I wonder what we really need is daycare. Can you put a daycare center on the complex? I mean, I just, I'm just a bit overwhelmed by this scale of this to say say that and very concerned about air quality in the city so thanks and i'll keep tuned to other i'll go to the planning board and i know this isn't the right place to make all these comments but just it does seem a, a terrible thing to put into downtown my my opinion okay thanks and thank you thanks claudia okay um i think that we've given our comments I hope they're useful. I just wanted to add that I noticed that you had shown an image of the new police station, and um, which isn't new anymore, I guess, but um, just a little fact, when that was built, uh, we actually gave it a preservation award, even though because it was a new, even it was a new building, um, they did such a great job of blending it into the downtown and you know retaining that presence in downtown and doing it in a you know a tasteful way. so. There's some um, precedent. Yeah, that is a looking at it, you know, in the context of this, it, it's a very impressive building how they did that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. So we'll see you again um, at a meeting of the Historical Commission to um, look at the 106 review. Great. Thank you. Good luck with the planning board. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. commissioners. Thanks so much. Okay. Have a good night. You're welcome to stick around. Um, so the next item on the agenda is uh, a re an update on the Florence National Register District. And um, 
I just, it was interesting in uh, the earlier conversation, uh, Claudia is still here. She had asked about, um, you know, that we're, we're often looking at sort of the significant buildings and the significant people. And a lot of times um, the less significant and the more vernacular buildings are overlooked. And I think this is a great example of, um, and Steve has done an incredible job of pulling this together, despite what, what MHC says, um, of, you know, looking at a collection of a lot of uh, buildings and some of them are quite humble. Um, and, but they have these associations with people who, you know, a lot of people in Northampton don't, don't know over where we're here. And, um, it's just, a, this is a great opportunity to, you know, um, bring out and celebrate the importance of all of the buildings and the people, even though they're not fancy high style, um, you know, so anyway, that's my little preface. Um, so Steve, we did get a copy of the draft nomination. And we also got a copy of the eligibility statement. Um, one of the questions I had uh, is the eligibility statement uh, new? Is that something you had that Neil and is it Catherine put together recently in response, not in response to the MHC letter, because that that letter just came the other day. What you saw there was actually missing from the original. And um, Neil gave his shot at, at providing one and I read it over and corrected some stuff and changed the emphasis a little bit according to what they were talking about in a statement of significance, which they, in so many words, they mentioned what historical figures, you know, were, were associated with, with the place. And we have a lot of them. So I, I rewrote it to mention Sojourner Truth, Garrison, Douglas, you know, Ruggles and all those folks. Okay. Um, so that's where those documents, did you get the letter uh, of July 28th? They, sh they show on here that they copied you on it, Martha. They did, yeah. I, okay. So that was what you were referring to. They have been supportive, yeah. but they, they don't agree on maybe with the approach uh, and um, it's a, it's an interesting and, and you can tell they went into it a uh, helpful letter in a, in, in a sense they're wanting to have the best outcome and mm -hmm. Neil's working on it right now I'm thinking about it um, and we may come down to which I suggested to Neil would be because they are so supportive well what would work for you what do you think would work better uh, mm -hmm. as a way to approach it um so, so Steve, before you go any further, could you just explain to everyone who's present and to the three of us too exactly where you are and how you know where we how we got to this point um just a brief overview um well it, it all began frankly with the mass historical commission themselves and they sponsored both the um Hill Ross Farm that's down at Grove Food, Northampton, and the Dorsey Jones House at 191 Nonatuck Street. And for me, it, it, with all the other buildings, especially ones, forgotten buildings of African-American and formerly enslaved folks that we found in that period of time between identifying Sojourner Truth's house, um, and which in a certain way, will never be on the National Register because it looks nothing like it does in, of, in the period of significance of the house. You know what I mean? There's certain restrictions on some of these houses that won't allow them to be included in the register in a standalone nomination. So um, a district seemed logical to me. And I'd worked with Catherine Grover and uh, Neil Larson on those two previous nominations. And so we went to CPA, they gave us 30,000 to hire them and put together um, a nomination. And it was really Catherine's idea to, to include a, what is a context statement for the entire city of Northampton around these issues so that 
other properties. We can point to other properties in Northampton that uh, are part of this abolition, um, uh, African Americans, and then it's a kind of um, vague term in a sense, but what would be called reform, uh, which would include things like Clark, Clark, uh, um, Clark School and the uh, Round Hill School and other things, other building places like that that aren't in a walkable district. But uh, okay, so and the way they approached it, and it looks like uh, in a way this is some of the issues they're having with it, is that um, to on one hand Neil wanted the the four hundred acres they're talking about are largely the four hundred acres that were included in the Northampton Association of Education and Industry. But to include those 400 acres includes, as they're saying, um, a number of over 100 um, non-contributing elements that um, Neil was making the point that they were all part of the development of the village of Florence, which all traces its roots to this utopian community, which they don't quite accept as as uh, as the way to go in a sense, I'm I'm wanting to like because I think Michael was he's out here and knows the area a little bit. Uh, I want them to think, help us think through because it, to go back to the original question, I don't think Northampton knows yet. You know, I may be gone when when this all finally peaks out of what we've learned up there and what it'll mean for. Um, a kind of tourism that will be more and more, uh, as the world gets harder to travel, local tourism is going to become more and more important. And uh, this, the whole place seems to be able to be made into, if you think about it as a whole, and that's back to what Claudia was talking about in the way of thinking of that area there, especially where we're talking uh, about the secondary part of why I'm here, um, down at the mill uh, and the dam area where arts and industry is and down there. That's a very amazing, nice little part that the city over and understandably kind of wants no part of yet. That's how I'll put it, because it's too hard a nut to crack with the liability of the dam and the river and uh, all the buildings that are down there and the different parties and all that. But it's, we walk there all the time with all sorts of classes of five-year-old, all the Amherst uh, regional um, middle school students, all of them are coming this fall to, to do this as one of our walking tours. And walking tours and that stuff exposes Northampton to people. I just gave a tour so I'm, I'm digressing, I know, but it's sort of like pitching why we want to, to do this. And I'm, I think we have a workable thing here. For their letter, um, I, I think I would read one thing from you from the letter, because did you other folks on the commission get the letter? You saw it? Well, that second paragraph is the, is the important one, right? Um, we acknowledge the significant body of research and documentation included in both the MPDF, which is the, the multiple document form for all the downtown and the Florence area form and are confident that the MPDF can provide a framework under which both individual properties and districts significant within the context theme may be listed in the national register. So that's an interesting I mean, that, that to me is the overriding thing here. And it shows that they're wanting to make this work to me. And uh, they may, because of their experience, they may have a better way to have it be more coherent for the for people that encounter it. So I, I, I don't take the letter as a, as a difficulty. Neil, Neil does, because he had it in his mind the way he wanted to go. And it was Catherine, I don't know if you folks, other folks are, familiar with her work, but it's just amazing. Those two nominations are really worth reading of the Dorsey Jones House and the uh, Bill Ross Farm. Uh, she's just great. And I don't know how she does it, frankly. And the new stuff she found and the fact with the uh, context statement that we get to include People's Institute is just, I love that. 
and she kind of draws a final distinction between Samuel Hill up in Florence and George Washington Table down in, in Northampton. It's a great read um, if you haven't looked at it in a while. So, um, so that's all good in my view. The next steps, do, do people have questions at this point? Because I intend to go on. I have one. Um, oh, go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Uh, um, so there's a national proposed national register district, which is a contiguous geographic area in Florence. And then there's a multi property, multiple property nomination. Um, and then in the letter, they talk about a framework. And then you also use the phrase context statement. So I think the way I'm putting this all together is that the context statement, the sort of intellectual framework, and the multiple property nomination are sort of one thing. Yep. And the Florence contiguous area is another thing. But they interconnect. But when you say context statement, it's coming about, it's part of the multiple property approach. Is that right? Yes, it is. It's it's in a sense one and the same. Okay. Um, but uh, the other thing that's interesting to think about, Catherine Grover and Neil uh, did the report to for the Massachusetts Historical Commission on interpreting the Underground Railroad in Massachusetts, and that's both the Hill Ross Farm and the Dorsey Jones House were selected for that. To, with two other properties out in Boston area to be representative uh, nominations to the National Register in their own right as part of that on, uh, that multiple property listing. Okay. And they and she kind of used that strategy with this. Um, and it has its ups and downsides, you know. Um, but I think. It, we can make we can help make it worth one of the things that it really does is the story if you have a second we have only a few minutes left but you tell me if i'm going too long okay or do you want me to stop now i would like no, to drive no. one point home okay yeah. why the why the multiple property uh dis, uh works is that we're in danger with having the florence thing be the main thrust uh of ignoring the Liberty Party and free soil folks downtown that weren't Garrisonian radical abolitionists. In my experience, there's no place like Northampton to see the contrast between the two styles and the abolition movement in the mid 1850s. And Henry S. Gare and his reminiscences of 1850 and, his, and, and he himself, you know, was an was an abolitionist of that stripe. He was one of the founding members of the old Hampshire um, Anti-Slavery Society in 1836. So this is how, and, and it allowed Catherine to tell that whole story, which has a little snippet up in Florence because J.P. Williston, one of the main people downtown, purchased the silk mill of the radicals and converted it to cotton manufacture, but hired fugitive slaves in his, his factory. So it's, it gets all jumbled in up there in Florence some, and you get these bits of both of them, and it, and it created a dynamic that um, is interesting uh, as, it, as it plays out with the Florence Congregational Church being established, then the uh, Cosmian Hall and Temple of Free Speech and all that kind of thing that went on. Up there. So it's a big story and it's, I, I, I've been happy to try to tell it. I would love people that write better than me, like Catherine, to work on it. And Chris Clark, I think, is interested in talking about after Utopia and what Florence happened. That was, I had a really good talk with him. Have you all had a chance to read The Communitarian Moment by Christopher Clark? who is now uh, living in, he's retired and now living in Northampton. And that is the single best, if you wanna get a sense for, for the place, that's the single best book. Uh, can I mention the other stuff while I'm here or do you want me to, any other questions about this? Well, let me just ask you um, about this particular project. Is there anything that we can do to help um, with your efforts with MHC? You know, um, 
is Michael or um, is, I guess it's Ben, right? Are you working with Michael or Ben or both? Probably both, right? Um, are they, you know, coming out? Have they come out? Um, would it be helpful if we, you know, supported you on that? I just, whatever we can do, because it's such an important project. And the city has money invested in it, obviously. Yeah. Yep. Um, right, right off because uh, they're locked in the this. This is the third go around that they're about to go into, and mm -hmm. I, I think it wouldn't necessarily be helpful to jump in in the middle of it. But when the right. final there's going to be a final review that I think probably you have to sign off on on some in some way or other. Um, but well, if, you do, if you do, if you do read, you know any. Now's the time. If you ever had anything to say about it, it would be to write a little thing up that might be helpful to them. But okay. in my, I'm I'm uh, only going to make that suggestion to Neil that okay, we've tried it this way. What do they really want to do? You know about the non-contributing buildings mm -hmm. in Florence. You know, and they have a really kind of dangerous suggestion, which is to expand the buildings, expand it actually, to, to deal with the buildings of the Nonatuck Silk Company and its development and Pro Brush and its development, which started as a, as a daguerreotype, you know, the Florence compound and all that. Um, yeah, so it really broadens the period of significance that you're then, working on. And then that, that, that worker housing that surrounds it becomes contributing. That's what I read him to say. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense in a certain way. It would be nice if we could could prove, and it would be more research to prove that the others, not just Hill, not just Williston, but the other folks um, like Burr and the other people that developed the um, the Florence group of industrialists up there, you know, uh, that they were part of this. What they describe as uh, Philanthropic paternalist industrialist philanthropist, which is kind of where Hill took the whole thing mm -hmm. at the end, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's an interesting proposal, but it see me, it, it would take a whole bunch more research and frankly, more money. Because mm -hmm. I don't think with as good as the writing is for Catherine in Catherine's case, I wouldn't want to entrust it to any lesser person for that because it's worth it just as that piece right now to how about yeah that. but it also involves kind of a different take on it which is a lot of effort um yeah, yeah. And, and which isn't as interesting to me as 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 getting all we can out of out of uh, that period of time uh that yeah. where the inspiration began well you know the other thing too they sort of suggest this is that you know maybe what this calls for is just a um an additional district that's not you know, that is contiguous or neck near, or it's the, you know, the Florence district or something like that. It's not that focus so much. It's not focused on that Northampton. Um, well, the, the other district that perhaps would be, in, which could be down the road. And I think this is what Ben was driving at. Mm -hmm. The South Street uh, and Con Street, Old South and Con Street is where African-Americans live and abolitionists live. And yes. where there was that was a lot of activity down here, down here, and right. um, there's other places like that. Um, but that one would be the one that stands out. We made a plaque for that down there. I think you may have seen it as it goes to go by. So that's interesting too. So, um, okay. well, we can, um, you know, think we can deliberate about it at our next meeting if we want to do a, um, you know, put put together some sort of support letter or opinion letter to send to MHC. I think that would might be a good idea, but I, I need some more time with reading the whole nomination because I didn't. Yeah, that's chance what I'd read. encourage people to do. We have time for that, for okay. sure, people to take their time and read it. It's it's really good, Catherine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sort of behind the scenes, Steve, are, is MHC just working out on their own, you know, what can be separated out into a different district? Or do you think they will really require you to add something additional at this point which unfortunately i don't think really I broader think project so. i don't think so okay um okay. I, I i don't know exactly how it will go 
Neil's Neil's pretty persuasive in the end, and he and and he's worked with them before around stuff oh, yeah. like that. Yeah. And they have, you know, the, they're a team that has a lot of experience. They just did the Chinatown in Boston um, d dual thing just like this. Um, so we'll we'll see. I don't think they will. I mean. But they could they call the shots in a sense because they're the ones that sign the thing that goes to the Fed, right? Correct. Yeah. Yes. So that's why I I you know, I'm just kind of watching how it's going. I'm certainly not trying to be come down hard on anybody yet, mm -hmm. but I think it does put the uh, ball back in their court to ask them, well, what will work, and it right. maybe that would be acceptable to us. And the a benefit of that is that does get them on our side, uh, actually, you know. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, but can I say you had briefly, a couple other things? Yeah, a couple of the things you wanted to ask us while you're on here. The police house. Uh, it's at the very beginning stages of picking it back up. I took a hiatus on it after uh, COVID, and I'm you know I look, this is one of the projects I I couldn't give up. I couldn't let it go. So um, I'm going ahead with what will preliminarily be a, probably a GoFundMe project um, where we get dendrochronology done on the building. And also, um, which Bill Flint is more than willing to do. By the way, he's now hung his shingle out as a dendrochronologist. I don't know if oh, you've wow. known that, but he's so retired. Before you go any further, does Steve and Greg, do you know the building that, okay, please tell us where the building, what the building is you're talking about. Do you both know Florence? And you know the dam? Yes, I know. Uh, the dam. It sits on the dam and was the gatehouse for the sluice works underneath the, uh, underneath there. In, in a, in a perfect world, it would be an archeological dig to get down there and see what those works were and and where they perhaps date from by comparing them to other metal works of the same kind down underneath there. Word has it that some of it was thrown away and sealed up, but there might be something left under there. Um, and I just looked at Bonnie's uh, redo of the 296 Nonatuck Street nomination by uh, uh, form B and she contends that it's after 1874 and Chris Thompson says no way it's much earlier than that so that's why we need and want to do the dendro okay. my uh, you know if, if I were predicting I'd say around 1855 for it and it's timber framed inside and it looks like the, the saw marks are right for that so which would put it with that if people, I sent Sarah, did you share the with other folks? If you want to take a peek at what I shared with Sarah uh, for- oh, Let me check, I might've missed that. Hang on one second. In the meantime, I will share- I sent a bunch of pictures of it. And if you look at what it gives you a chance- oh. Here's Google Earth and let me, let me grab those too. Yeah, there's Google Earth. That says it looked, which is pretty nice, but it looks horrible now. And that's the biggest reason. We were back in touch with uh, with Doug McBee at Nonatuck Mills, and he is willing to make a lease up. He mentioned 50 year lease to whoever wants to have it to be able to get public funds or at, at least we could kind of own it. But, Florence could lease it, you know, somehow. And so I don't even know if it's, if the Ruggles Center is the right one. The importance of this historic site is that it was the Josiah White linseed oil mill site, first mill, uh, first use of that mill up there. Uh, there were earlier mills at that site but of that particular stone foundation you see. Um, that was the Josiah White oil mill where Whitmarsh came and started his silk mill, and then where the Lydia Mariah Child and David B. Child did their sugar beet experiment, then where the Northampton Association had a bathhouse and grist mill, and 
um, and then it became the Nonatuck Silk Mills Gatehouse for their dam. And I don't know if you look at Bonnie did a good good job. It was such a huge employer in Northampton. The Nonatuck Silk was like mm -hmm. the pro brush of the you know up to 1920s. There was this. So she looked into that. I thought it was really good about how big Nonatuck Silk was up until it sold out. Did you find that, Sarah? I, I don't have access to it. So you shared a folder, but I can't see it. Um, but I'll I'll request that from you and send them to everyone. Okay. All right. But that has, uh, so there was this wonderful Gothic cottage across the street. It was built by Macomber, a silk merchant. Um, do you want to know, know any of this? I, I, I never know if people really want to know because I, I, you know, but um, uh, well, we, there was this um, period where Samuel Hill couldn't start this, restart the silk industry because George W. Benson left town under a cloud of bankruptcy and Hill had signed on his notes. So Hill had to lease his silk mill to this other silk maker, Macomber, who built this got amazing Gothic cottage right across the street from this sluice house. And if you, if you look at what I sent, there's evidence to me that it was built about the same time because it, it's a Gothic cottage that's timber framed inside and it's a Gothic form and, uh, and it has vertical boards like like the the uh, old gothic so there's a lot of reasons to try and save it especially if it's older yeah chris says yeah. no way 1874 but it's so small it doesn't even show up on old maps huh. and then okay. we're, uh, i was very much relieved that doug mcbee is a great guy and i think that this could be a step in working with them at nonatuck mills um he's very much into our work at the ruggle center and he wants to do it. They have all their hands full of trying to make sure that place is full of tenants and trying to do the upkeep on that huge building. And mm -hmm. with his shareholders, he he couldn't justify spending what this thing will take to, right? Wow. So he doesn't want it demolished. He'd like it looking better because he looks out the window at it. So he's all about us trying to make it work somehow. But just think, walk down there. I would encourage the whole historical commission to take a walk together down there uh, and what it could be, you know. It looks at yeah. David Basil Dorsey's second house is down there. David Ruggles' house is down there. Um, it's it's just an amazing sight. And we should keep our eyes out for David Rugg uh, for Basil Dorsey's house coming on the market and what could happen with it sometime. I don't know when, but you can imagine it in its heyday. And the pictures I sent you show it back in the heyday. Yeah. All right, I'm Great. sorry. No, don't apologize. Were no. there, was there something else that you wanted to ask us about, Steve? Um, I'm working on, on uh, something else that's not ready to talk about at all yet. But, uh, okay. you know, um, I just, you know, as the, it develops. So we're just buttoning up, hopefully, the sluice house, we call it. Uh, for the winter and, and finding out if we can. It may not have dateable timbers in it, but Bill's gonna assess it and see. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, well, please keep us posted. And we appre always appreciate your presence at our meetings because you're such a wealth of information. So well, I love thank you. Too. I love being there. <laughs> yeah, it shows. And thanks for listening. Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what did I do in my agenda? Other business uh, not foreseen um, when the agenda was prepared. Um, does anybody else have anything else that they would like to bring up? Greg or Steve? So we'll be looking for the, um, hopefully by Labor Day, which I know is very, I was told was very early this year, maybe not for our next meeting, but our meeting after that, we'll have something to discuss, I would hope. Um, okay. 
And the other thing I just wanted to raise was uh, meeting in person. Uh, I, I mean, there are two of our members that are not here, um, but we could um, make a preliminary decision about that and see how it flies. Um, how do Steve and Greg, I know Steve, you're an advocate of in person. How about you, Greg? I don't remember what you thought about that. You know, I, I see both. Um, I've got to be in my office, uh, but uh, no, I think in person might be a good, a good thing for us. Okay. When you say you've got to be in your office, meaning it would be hard for you to get there? Uh, no, I was, uh, I was detailed here for Monday night. I can switch that. Okay. So, okay. Not a problem. But I is think in person will be good. Okay. So, Sarah, is there a process we need to go through to make that happen? Uh, just, no, I mean, I just need to know when we're doing the agenda, whether it will be in, in person or remote. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we should plan on it unless, you know, Dylan and Barbara have a objection. Okay. I know COVID's on the rise again. My brother just had it, so I don't know how people are feeling, but. I Did we want to think about that for the August meeting or? I'm happy to do August, September, whatever. How do people feel about that? You, it sounds like Greg and Steve, you're fine with either too. Yeah. Do you want to send a, um, can you do that, uh, Sarah, send out a note to all of us and have us weigh in on it? Yeah, I'll send it up. Cool. Okay, why don't we do that? And then we'll decide. And then we'll just post mm -hmm. it one way or another. Okay. Um, Jackie, do you have your hand up. Did you have one other, something else that you wanted to mention or? Maybe not. Okay. Um, well, if that, Jackie? Oh, I just wanted to say this has been one of the most interesting and informative meetings I've been to in a long time. Thank you all. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right. If that is all, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn, and we'll see you at the end of, the, of August. Adjourn. Okay. Second. Everyone say yes. 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 <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Nice Thank to you. see you.